15, verse number 7. It reads, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. NIV says, accept one another just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. King James says, therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us for the praise of God. Amen. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Um, I want to use this as the theme of my message. I don't know if I would do two Sundays talking about this. You're welcome to church. Amen. You're welcome to church. But I'm going to use this as the title of my main message today. I am an example. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. you are looking at an example. Yes. Tell them again, I am an example. I am an example. That's the wrong neighbor. Find another neighbor. Say, neighbor, neighbor. You, are you are looking at an example. An example. Say, I am, I am an example. Amen. Amen. Come on, clap your hands for Jesus as you take us. You may take your seats, somebody. You are welcome to church. You are welcome to church. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. The word that the Bible uses for welcome means wholeheartedly or acceptance. When you say welcome, it means it has to be wholeheartedly, or in other words, it means acceptance. One scholar doesn't use the word welcome because he implied welcome can be used without meaning. So you can have a sign outside the door of the church that says, you're welcome. But that doesn't mean that people come to church, they will feel welcomed. So when he began to look at the word welcome, he says, rather look at it as acceptance. Because welcome can be used without meaning. Because not everybody you said you're welcome were ever welcomed in your life. Amen. So many times we use the word welcome because of tradition, because of religion. We think when we say the word, we mean the word. So many people took the word and they, they thought it meant what it said, but they figured out the hard way that sometimes just because there is a sign that says welcome doesn't mean you are welcome in that place. Hallelujah. So, so it's a culture of bringing someone into our home, inviting someone to your table. When someone comes to your table, it's more than just welcoming them. They become part of your life. So when Paul says, welcome one another, it means invite them, share your life with them. Because God's plan is we must accept and receive and welcome one another. When we talk about salvation, we're talking that it's, it's God's grace and deliverance for every one of us, not just for a certain group, but it speaks that everybody we must receive with open arms. Somebody should I understand? I, understand. I want you for a moment to think of a time that you almost felt not welcomed. Now, now let's not talk about other churches because we will not stand up for other churches. 
I want you to think for a time that you almost hesitated to come to FECC because you felt like you were not welcomed in this place. Even though the door was opened for you to come in, but when you came in, you almost hesitated not to come back again because you felt like you were not welcomed. No, let's forget about you. I want you to think about someone you know, a relative, a friend, a neighbor, a loved one, a workmate, who you know can hesitate to come in this place because you know that they won't feel welcomed when they come in this place. Now we are sitting right here and we may not be proud to say this, but there is a culture that is in this place that may not let everybody feel to come and worship with us. Are we together, Church of God? Amen. We talk about, we love everybody. Come, come, come. The doors of the church are opened. But the, the question is, how far are they opened? Uh, uh, probably it's just a crack on the door that is opened. How far is the door opened to allow everybody to come? In fact, here's the greatest question. What are the credentials that are required for you? To come in fellowship at FECC. Amen. What, what, what do you have to do to qualify to be welcomed to come and fellowship with us in this place? Hallelujah. So, so now let's look at a case study because this is going to be very important. In Mark 14 verse 3, verse, verse 3 to 7, it talks about a certain type of a woman the Bible says, and while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at a table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves, why was this ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. Now before I say something, let's again look at in Luke 7. The same story, but in a different uh, interpretation. The Bible says, when, now when the Pharisee who had invited her, who had invited him, sorry, saw this, he said to himself, if this man was a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him. For she is a sinner. For she is a sinner. So now they scolded her. They scolded her for only wanting to see Jesus. Some says if she, if he knew what manner of woman she was and what she did for a job, this was a woman of the night. They said if he knew, if he was truly a prophet, he would have known what manner of woman this was. And not only what manner of woman she was, but what she did for a job. The doors were opened. That's why she got in. But was she welcomed in church? The doors were opened, but was she accepted in church? And she only needed to see Jesus, but because of what manner of woman she was and because of what she did she was not welcomed in church uh, I don't need to be too spiritual I just want you to think for a little while who do you know because of where they are because of who they know because of who 
they love because of what they did. If they are to come in this church, they won't feel welcomed. I don't, I don't need to go deeper. I, I just want you to take for a moment. Who among your friends, because of who they chose to love, because of what they do at night, because of how they choose to fellowship with other people around them, who among the people that are close to you, you know, can hesitate to come and fellowship in this church. You are welcome to church. When we tell people that the doors of the church are opened, how far and how wide are they opened? What are their credentials that we, they must have to be able to access at the place of worship, this woman only needed time with Jesus, but because of what she did, they scolded her. They talked behind her back because of her past. They thought she did not deserve to be in the midst of Jesus. Am I talking to people in the house? Amen. I said, am I talking to people in the house? Amen. Now, 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 when we talk about your welcome, it speaks about the universality of salvation. You know that when we talk about salvation, it's not only people that are born again that deserve salvation. When we talk about salvation by definition, it is inclusive of everybody. When we talk about salvation, it, it includes every one. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, that big blue circle that you see on national, for God so loved the world. He loved the world. It's salvation is inclusive, it's, it's diverse, it, it includes everybody. In fact, it's not only the world, he loved all that are in the world. Hallelujah, Church of God. Uh, now, now, now the Bible says, uh, the, the, Oh, come to me, all oh, ye. Come to me, all oh, ye. There is not much that is left after all. Not much is left when we talk about all. So the Bible says, Come ye, all oh, that needs rest. And I will give you rest. So it's inclusive. It's it's diverse. It's not people that come to church. It's everybody in the world. Uh, salvation is inclusive. It's, 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 it's diverse. Everybody has a chance to bite the cake of salvation. It doesn't matter you hate them. It, it, it doesn't matter you don't like their, their way of living. It doesn't matter you don't like uh, the people that they fall in love with. Oh, yes. It doesn't matter how you hate the work that they do. It doesn't matter. Everybody has a chance to bite the cake of salvation. It's, it's inclusive. It's, it's diverse. It's universal. The Bible says, uh, Behold, I am knocking on the door. If any man, not some men no other men or woman if any man hears my voice it's 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 another salvific term if any man or woman hears my knock and opens up the door i don't care where they were last night i don't care who they were with last night i don't care who their friends are i don't care who they love if they hear my knock and open the door i will come in and i will dine with them regardless of what they did yesterday regardless of who they were with i i don't care if they just hear my knock and open the door, I will come in. Amen. <sighs> this becomes tricky if you are religious. It becomes tricky if you, you are traditional because you think you get closer to Jesus based on your performance. 
it, it, it becomes so frustrating to you if you are a religious person because you think it's what you do that determines how Jesus welcomes you. But Jesus doesn't talk about performance. He doesn't talk about qualification. He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. He, he, doesn't, he, he, he doesn't matter about how perfect you are because he doesn't call the perfect. He perfects the called. So he says, if you just hear my voice and if you just open the door I don't care how tall you are I don't care how short you are I don't care how big you are I don't care you have a bowed head or you have long hair I don't care you are black or you are white you are Chinese or you are a colored or you are Tosa you are Shona you you speak different I don't care if you just hear my voice and you open the door I will come in because when it comes to salvation, it's universal. It's diverse. I don't look at the color of your skin. Because when I look at you, I only see one color, which is red. The blood of Jesus that was shed for your sins. So when I look at you, I'm not seeing white, green, black, yellow, brown, whatever. I'm seeing the color red, which is the sun, the blood of my son. If any man... He is my knock. And he opens. Whew, I'm just going to come in. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 38, he begins to speak prophetically. He speaks prophetically, and Paul repeats that in Romans 10, verse 22. He says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. It shall come to pass that everyone, inclusive, diverse, it doesn't matter who you are, everyone, the universality of salvation, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. When you call the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Amen. Jesus, in his mission statement, said, I did not come for those that are righteous. Yes. Jesus, in his mission statement, he said, I did not come for those that are not sick. He said, I came for those that are sick. I came for those that are not well. I am the great physician, and I am looking for sick people who need healing. And in Luke 19, verse 10, the Bible says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Listen to me. He came to save sinners. He came to save sinners. If you are not a sinner, he did not come to save you. Amen. He came to save sinners. And if you are not a sinner, he did not come to save you. Can I say this? Are you ready, somebody? Yes. Sin is an equal opportunity employer. Sin does not discriminate. Paul says in Timothy, Christ came to save sinners. He is the savior of sinners. And if you are not, he did not come to save you. Seriously, if you are not a sinner, Jesus did not come for you. Amen. Amen. And Paul takes, takes it to another notch. He says he came to save sinners. Just in case you are wondering who. Me, I'm the chief of sinners. Oh, are you ready for church? Amen. Tend to your neighbor say, welcome to church. Welcome. Say like me, say, welcome to church. Welcome to church. Hallelujah. Amen. I said, hallelujah. Paul uses the term sinners about seven times. In his speech, he uses the term sin. Why? And most of the times, he doesn't define the word sinners. He describes it because he includes himself in it. Amen. So you hear terms like, I was a persecutor of the children of God. I was so and so. I did this and that and that and that. He included himself. He's not saying it's so and so. No, he says, us. He says, accept others. As Christ accepted us. Yeah. 
Oh, accept others as Christ accepted Apostle Josh, accepted major prophet or minor prophet or emirators, whatever they are. Accept others as he accepted you. Hallelujah, Church of God. Amen. It's an interesting parent. Accept one another as Christ has accepted you in order to bring praise to God. In order to bring, so Paul personalizes it, Church of God. He, he, puts, he, he puts his skin in the game. He said, accept others as he has accepted me as Paul. So I have to have a mandate of accepting you as he has accepted me personally. Amen. I need to accept you as he has accepted me. Whatever your stuff is, bring it to church. Because I brought mine and I was accepted. Not by the pastor. Amen. I was accepted not by the usher. Amen. I was accepted not by the deacon. I was accepted by Christ. Can I go to the deep end of the pool? Amen. Now let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15. Timothy 1 verse 15. This is a faithful saying. Paul is talking to Timothy. He said, son, when he's speaking to Timothy, he says, my son, I'm writing to you, my son. He's saying, I'm writing to you the next generation. He said, this is a faithful saying that I'm talking to you. This is a faithful saying, and you can rely on this saying, and you can count on this saying. And what saying was that? That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He says, you can rely on this message. You can rely on this scripture. You can rely on this prophetic word that I'm giving to you, my son. That Christ Jesus came to save sinners. Not only did he come to save sinners, but I am the chief. He came to save sinners like me. Not just like me. I am the chief of the sinners. I am the chief of the sinners. This is not spiritual arrogance. But this is a shameful admission of humility of how far God had to reach out to take Paul from where he was. Paul is shamefully admitting how far God had to reach to get him. He is saying, I don't know about you. Maybe, maybe your issue is you forgot to pray before you slept. Maybe your issue is you forgot to pray when you were eating. But I look at myself. I know how far Jesus had to reach out to pick me up. And when I look at how far he had to reach to pick me up, I can look at that and I can measure myself and I can see that I am a chief sinner. Amen. Praise the name of the living God. Amen. Uh, it, it speaks both of his psychology and his theology because he recognizes his position and sees himself before God as the least one who needs more grace and one who needs more mercy. You see, when we're standing here and I'm standing here and we're sitting there, when I look at myself, I don't measure myself based on what you did. I measure myself based on God. And I look at my position and I look at where God is. And I see the distance that is from where I am and where he is. And I can see that I need more grace in my life. So when I begin to worship, I don't worship him based on the measurement of the sin I did and the sin you did and I say I did less than you did. No, I measure myself based on where I am and based on how far I am with God. And if I see that the distance between where I am and where Jesus is is far, then when I worship God, I worship like there is nobody next to me or my husband, my wife is close to me. 
I worship based on the grace that he has shown me. And I say, God, if you didn't show me this grace, I don't deserve to be here. I'm not here to talk about someone, what they did last night, who they were with last night. I'm here to talk about how far I see myself to you. And when I look at that, God, thank you for the grace. Thank you for the mercy. I know I don't deserve it, but you made it a point that I deserve to be in your house. So thank you because I was the chief of the sinners. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Somebody shall I understand? Shall I understand? So when Paul says, I am the chief of the sinners, the word chief that he chooses to use to explain his term is the word, we get the word proto. Proto means prototype. So when he said, I am the chief, he means I am the prototype. The word prototype means first in line or first in position. So when Paul says, I am the chief, he say, I am the prototype of sin. I am the first in line. When you begin to talk about this thing called sin, I jump in first in line. Amen. When you begin to talk about sin, I am the prototype of sin. I am the proto of sin. I am first in line. I don't, I don't look at uh, sister so-and-so, uh, they dress, they wear short skirts, uh, brother so-and-so, they have a different hairstyle. No, no, no. I look at myself and I measure the distance between me and God. And I could only say I am first in line. Because your relationship and your God, I'm not there to define it, but I define my relationship with God. And all I can say is I am the prototype. Do I have prototypes in here? Amen. I said, do I have prototype sinners in this house? Ah, yes. uh, don't I, I said, do I have prototype sinners in the house? Yes. Don't, don't, don't look at your neighbor and, and think about what would they say. I said, do I have prototype sinners in the house? Yes. I am the chief of sinners. So Paul is not grading his sin. But he was grading his life. So he's not saying my sin is bigger than yours. <laughs> because you don't know how people sin in the world. He's not grading his sin. No, no. He was grading his life. He says, when I look at me and I look at him and I see how far it is from me to him, I'm in desperate need of his grace. I'm in desperate need of his mercy because I know me. I know what I have done. I don't know what you have done. I don't know where you were last night, but I know where I was last night. I know what I did last night. I don't know what you did, but I know what I did. I look at Josh, and I know what I did. I know what I did. And I look at Jesus, and I begin to measure how far it is. Amen. And I begin to see I need his grace. Yes. So when I begin to grade, I'm not grading my sin. I'm grading my life. Amen. And when I grade my life, I come to one conclusion. I'm chief of sinners. I don't know about you. I don't know what rank you have. But if I grade my life, not my sin, if I grade my life, I'm chief of sinners. Somebody shall I understand? I understand. Ah, so I understand. So in 1 Timothy chapter 1, 16, he says, but for that very reason, I was shown mercy. Somebody say, thank God for mercy. So that in me, the waste of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example. As an example. He says, Christ Jesus, he says, I know that God has shown me mercy. So that in me, the worst of sinners, the chief of sinners, the prototype of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. He says, I am an example. 
He says, my life was so far gone that God had to go a long way to reach out to me. He was not talking about the kind of sin he did. Are you ready for this church of God? Amen. Paul was not talking about the kind of sin that he did, but he was talking about the commitment to sin he had. Amen. It's one thing to sin. It's another thing to be committed to the sin. So when Paul begins to grade his life, he was not talking about the type of sin or the kind of sin. He was talking about his commitment to sin. He said, not only was I a persecutor, I enjoyed persecuting. So he's saying, what I did, I did not do it by coincidence. I didn't do it by accident. There's a scripture in Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 says, Brethren, if any man be overtaking the fruit, it speaks just as of you have accidentally seen. But can I cut to the chase? When was the last time you accidentally sinned? When was the last time you sinned by accident? Oh God, oh, I sinned by accident. When was the last time I sinned by accident? Ah, let's, let, let's not deep sigh and get deeper there. I just want you to think for some seconds. When was the last time I did something by accident? Amen. Amen. Paul says, this is not an accident. This is a commitment to sin. Everything that I did, I was committed. Mm. I went to that house to see that guy, not by accident. Yeah. I was committed to see that guy. I, I went to that girl house, not by, I didn't just bump, uh, wake up and say, where, where, am I, where am I? No, no, no. <laughs> I was committed Amen. to the scene. <laughs> I, I, I knew what I was doing. I, I, I called them and checked if they were home. I, I, I looked for an Uber. And I, I, I saw that Uber was expensive. Then I did in drive. And I negotiated. I was so good with my negotiation that the price went to half the price that I was supposed to buy to pay for Uber. And I dressed very well, not just in a decent way. I had to make it sexy so that they know why I'm there. Am I talking to church? Huh? I'm, I'm here to preach to real people in the house. So it was not an accident. I was committed. I didn't want them to guess why I came to the house. I wanted them to know why I was there. I was so committed. It was not an accident. Paul says, when I began to look at this thing, I see how committed I was. I, I didn't just happen to kill people by accident. I was so much enjoying it that when they were stoning Stephen, I was watching and I was smiling that this is so nice. <laughs> Hallelujah. It was, it was not an accident. I was so committed to doing what I was doing. And Paul says, I am the chief. So Paul says, I am chief because of the level of my commitment. What makes me the prototype is the level of my commitment. But God saved me and he made me an example. God saved me and he made me an example. The word example that Paul uses is it's a picture of a sketch. It's a picture of, of a first draft of a picture. You know, you know when you are drawing a picture, the first draft, he says, God made me an example and he put my life on display. That means I am an example. The reason why God saved you is so that you may become an example. Yeah. So what it means is if you go to the dictionary and you look for the definition of a sinner, you see me. Amen. 
I am an example. If you say a definition of sinner in the dictionary, you see me, I appear as an image because I am an example. You put my life on display because I was the chief. I didn't just sin. I was committed to sin. Amen. And then he says in Romans chapter 15, just as ye received me, so must I receive you. Amen. This is deep. He says, you know, you know what I did last night? How committed I was to what I did last night? Jesus saved me. He, he reached out and he picked me. And he saved me. And he made me an example. And he put my life on display. I became the definition of an example of a sinner. And yet by his mercy and his grace, he saved me. And just the way he saved me and accepted me, I accept you also. Amen. Somebody shall welcome to church. Welcome to church. It, it, it's, it's funny because in Romans 7 verse 19, he describes the struggle. He begins to describe this struggle. He says, I look at my life, the things that I want to do. Because of my struggle, that's the things that I don't do. When I wake up in the morning and I say, I'm not going to do this. But the time the sun goes down, I have done what I said I'm not going to do. I don't want to do it. There is a battle in me. It's, it's, it's pulling me to do it. And another one is pulling me not to do it. Amen. My flesh is saying do it. But my spirit is saying don't do it. So Paul is saying come up in this church. Come up to faith empowerment Christian Center. Why? Because he is still working with us. So you are not coming to our church because we are perfect. You are coming to our church because Jesus is busy working on us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Come up to Faith Empowerment Christian Center because Jesus is busy working on us. He's not done with us yet. Amen. Most of us here are ex something. Some of us are ex-cheaters, ex-sinners, ex-liars, ex-thieves, ex and some of us are not ex yet. So when I say welcome to this building, welcome to this church, I'm saying welcome because Jesus is busy dealing with exes in this house. And some of us are still praying to be an ex. Come on, sir. So I'm not welcoming you because this is a perfect church. This is not a museum of perfect creatures or perfect artists. No, this is a hospital. This is an ICU. This is a place full of sick people that needs healing. So when you come in this church, all I can do is there is a free bed next to me. You can take that. Why? Because I am an example. My life is on display. I'm not there to hide that if it wasn't for Jesus, I would be where I am. It's the grace of Jesus. The reason why I know that Jesus is working on me is because the spirit of God in me makes me to feel bad when I do it. Amen. The, 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 the only difference between the past me and the now me is now when I do it I feel bad yes. do you remember the time when you did it and you never felt bad about it you felt proud about it you told everybody what you did and you got high fives and you got hugs because you were proud but now because of the Holy Spirit inside of you you feel guilty Amen. so how do I know that God is in my life I feel bad when I do it Oh, yes. I feel bad. Amen. I feel bad. So because I feel bad, and yet he accepted me in his house. Paul says, accept others just as he has accepted you. It's personal. 
Because the way he accepted you is not the way he accepted me. So when he says that, it opens up my eyes of understanding to know that just because mine was different from yours doesn't mean I have to grade your sin to mine. But I grade my life to God, not my sin to your sin. So when I say come to church, I'm saying, I don't know the level because nobody knows which one is the big sin. Nobody ever has gone to be God for a little while to grade that if you steal a pen and you steal a phone, which one is the best? Because you don't know how that pen was so important to the person you stole it from and that phone was that 11th phone for the person you stole it. So we don't know how to grade which one is the big sin because sin is sin in impact. Hallelujah. So I can't come here and begin to grade your sin to mine and say you must be a sinner because of what you did last night. Amen. Amen, church of God. Amen. But I grade my life. I look at God and I begin to grade my life. And Paul says, just as he did it for you, welcome others. Welcome people to my house. Accept others as he has accepted you. It doesn't matter their background. Don't talk about where they're coming from. No, accept them. This is a hospital. We don't chase away people and say you are too sick. No, we welcome them. The, the more sicker they are, the more deserving they have to be in the house. Amen. Welcome. This is a hospital. We welcome you to faith empowerment. This is not a museum. If you came, I always say this and I'll say it again. If you came to this church looking for a perfect church, it's no longer perfect because you came in this place. Amen. So if it was a perfect before you came, and you came in this place because you wanted a perfect church, the moment you stepped in, it was no longer perfect because of you. Amen. So there is no perfect church, oh, yes. but there is a perfect God. Oh, yes. So everybody that comes in this place, this is not a museum of artistic sculptures of perfect things that have been sculpted by the best people. No, this is a hospital. Thank you, Jesus. So the question becomes, when did he accept you? Did he accept you after you became perfect? No. Did you have to leave all you did? The woman came in the place in Bethany. The Bible says she came into the house and she began to anoint the feet of Jesus with the same oil that she used to attract her customers. Yeah. Amen. This was the same way that she attracted her men in her life. And she anoints the feet of Jesus to make him feel welcomed. So Jesus didn't say, go and fix yourself before you come to my presence. He says, come as you are. Come, come as you are. Don't try to be perfect and come. I accept you as you are. I will fix you. And when I fix you, I will make you an example and I'll put you on display. Amen. And I'm here to announce to somebody that I am an example of how a chief sinner is. Amen. Watch my words. Paul says, I am the chief of sinners. Amen. He didn't say who sinned. He said, I'm still a sinner. This was present. He didn't say what I used to sin. I, was, I, I used to be a chief sinner. No, he said, I am the chief sinner. That means I'm still a sinner. Because every time I wake up in the morning and I look at my life and I look at God, there is a big difference. And as long as that difference is still there and I still need the mercy and the grace of God, I will never stop worshiping him and thanking him and asking him for forgiveness over and over again. And just because he accepted me, even though I was committed to my sin, 
must give me an idea of allowing people that are also struggling with sin. Amen. So I want to say, I won't fight, I won't stand on Judgment Day to defend other churches, but I will defend this church. And I will say, this church is welcome to receive any one. Hallelujah. Amen. I said hallelujah. Amen. We do not discriminate who comes to worship in this place. Oh, yes. We do not chase people that come to worship in this place. Amen. We don't judge them because of their sin, what they did, where they were. This is a hospital. Everybody is welcome to fellowship in this place. You are all welcome Amen. to Faith Empowerment Christian School. Stand up in the prayer.